everyone. Today's topic has to do with how God deals with uh, saved people who get off into sin. Now, I've given it that theme because the question came to us in the form of an email, had a few different parts to it. Uh, one question was, is it possible that God can be angry with his children? And then as a follow-up to that, the person asked about Romans 5 and verse 9, and that is a verse that talks about being saved from wrath through Him, through Christ. Uh, so I believe what the person is getting at is if we've been saved from wrath through the uh, payment that Christ made on the cross, then doesn't that mean God would never be angry with His children? We have been saved from that anger. And then finally, the, the email asked about uh, Ananias and Sapphira, and it, it certainly is implied in Acts chapter 5 that God put them to death for what they did. So how does that factor into God being angry with his children? So let me deal with these one by one. First of all, is it possible for God to be angry with his children? Absolutely. Any parent will testify that although we love our children unconditionally, there are times that they drive us crazy. There are times that they break our hearts, uh, they disappoint, they vex, they grieve us. Uh, you can put whatever term you want to it. I believe anger is a, is a fine word uh, for the feeling uh, that comes over us when our children rebel and, and misbehave. And God, as our loving and responsible and good Heavenly Father, He cannot allow our sins to go unchecked. As His children, there are times, because He loves us, that He has to step in and put a stop uh, to our nonsense. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6, the Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So when the Bible speaks of chastening, that has to do with a punishment or punishing. And then when it uh, talks about scourging, that is, it depends on where you're from in the world, but people would call that a whipping or a hiding. Uh, here in South Africa, I believe the Afrikaners would call that a pox law. Uh, so it depends on where you're from, what, what you would call that. But God knows just what it takes to get our attention when we're uh, veering off the path of righteousness. So can God become angry with His children? Yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean He ever stops loving us. Uh, listen to this verse, Revelation 3, verse 19. Jesus said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So you can see clearly in that verse, love is still there, even though he might have to rebuke and chasten or punish us. Now, the next part of the question had to do with Romans 5 and verse 9. Paul says there, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, as it was given in the email, the idea there is, this verse seems to teach that God wouldn't be angry with His children. Now, we have to allow the book of Romans to tell us what kind of wrath we've been saved from. Is it the kind of wrath or anger that God might feel towards His children? Uh, no, I don't see anything in the book of Romans that would uh, give us that idea. In Romans chapter 1, Paul uses the word wrath in verse number 18. He says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So there the word wrath is used for the punishment that God is giving uh, for sin that has not been repented of. Chapter 2, it's much the same thing. Verse number 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So the word wrath is used speaking about the ultimate punishment for somebody who lives a lifetime of sin, never repents of it, never gets saved, and then they have to face that, that wrath of God on the day of their judgment. So by the time we get to Romans 5, Paul is explaining that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, that blood that was shed, it made an atonement for us. It was a sacrifice for our sins. And because of that, we have been saved from that ultimate punishment or that wrath. 
So Romans 5 and verse 9 is dealing with a sinner who is now saved from that ultimate punishment uh, that they were facing for their sins. And nothing about this particular context in Romans 5 would talk about how God is uh, dealing with one of his children who might be making some mistakes. Now, how does this tie into Acts chapter 5? Well, there we have Ananias and Sapphira who have lied to the Holy Ghost. Uh, it says in, in Acts 5 and 3 that Satan filled uh, Ananias' heart. He lied to the Holy Ghost. In verse 4 it says, He's not lied unto men but unto God. And then in verse 5, he falls down dead. Now the question specifically was, did God cause uh, his death and, and Sapphira's death? Well, it doesn't explicitly say that God did that, but most certainly it is implied in that passage. There, were, there was no human instrumentation uh, there. There was no executioner or anything like that. Uh, Ananias just dropped down dead. So I would say that, that, that God certainly caused that. I think the underlying question here is not so much did God cause that, but is this setting some sort of a precedent for how God uh, could possibly deal with his children? Is it possible that a child of God could get so far off the path that God could cause them uh, to die? And there I'd have to say definitely yes. Uh, this is something Paul made clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In that chapter, he's dealing with the Corinthian church about their mistakes uh, surrounding the Lord's Supper. And one of the mistakes they were making is that they were partaking of the memorial, uh, of the bread and the cup, without examining themselves first. So they were taking lightly what the bread and the cup represents. Uh, when we take that bread and drink from that cup, we are reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And we're reminded that Jesus is coming again and we'll partake of, of this type of fellowship with him in the kingdom. So we should be living a life that is worthy of the sacrifice he made and a life that we would not be ashamed of if Jesus were to appear now and, and then we see him face to face. So based on that, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now the Corinthian church wasn't doing that. So in verse 30, Paul says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So some of these believers were getting sick and some even dying because they were allowing sin to go on in their life unchecked. And they were not measuring their lives next to the sacrifice and the second coming of Christ. So the passage goes on to say in verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Verse 32 says, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So this ties it right back into Hebrews 12 and verse 6. This is how God deals with His children. If they get off into sin and they're not paying attention to how they live and they're destroying their testimony, the testimony of the church, and the testimony of Christ overall, then it is possible for God to take that child of His home to heaven before their appointed time. Now, there are many more things that can be said about how God deals with His children, but I don't want to end this video without reminding you of the long-suffering and the tremendous love that God has to His children. Just because it is possible for God to get angry and to punish his children does not mean that our Heavenly Father is up in heaven looking for a reason uh, to be cross with us. That's not the case at all. Friend, he eagerly desires for you to draw nigh unto him. And there is not anything that one of his children has ever done that would make it impossible for them to have fellowship with him. No matter what you've done, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That verse was not written for lost people and telling them how to be saved. That was written to somebody who is already saved and it instructs them on how they can have joy and fellowship and the fullness of God in their life. So can God be angry? Yes. But does God have to be angry?
Not at all. You can draw nigh unto Him, and the Bible promises that He will draw nigh unto you. I hope this has helped. If you have any further questions about this topic, please feel free to leave it in the comment section below. Click subscribe if you'd like to keep up with our Bible Q&A vlog. And if you live in Patras Throne, please feel free to stop by this Sunday for one of our services. May God bless and have a great day forever.